Sunday at 4.30pm, Chelsea will be welcoming the treble winners and current table toppers, Manchester City to Stamford Bridge. And to say this one's going to be a tough test would be an understatement because after an early season shake, if you want to call it that, Man City are now finding their feet. They're picking up pace and they're going through the gears. And should they turn us over on Sunday, they will be going into the international break top of the Premier League table. But there is newfound optimism amongst the fan base after what we hope will prove to be a season-defining win against Spurs. And as I've always said, the bigger games suit us, the more attacking teams suit us. And you know what? Going off the performances this season against Liverpool, against Arsenal, and now against Spurs, maybe being the underdog suit us. People, if you are new around here, welcome to the Joey Knight podcast. At the end of this video, if you like it, you want to see more from myself, hit the subscribe button. And if you are already subscribed, or even if you're not, very rarely, if ever, do I ask you to hit the like button. But I've been told I should. I've been told that it helps pump the video out to more people. So everyone now, hit that like button. I would be massively appreciative. This is my preview for Sunday's game against Manchester City. So I will be picking my starting lineup. I'll react to Mauricio Pochettino press conference today and ultimately and inevitably I will give my score prediction for this game let's get into it. Right, so Mauricio Pochettino's press conference took place today. It was an interesting one. He spoke about a number of different things. He spoke about Reese James obviously not going on international duty. I will, if you're interested, drop my thoughts on that because we heard apparently Gareth Southgate has said that that puts his place at risk. Gareth Southgate, you're a fucking idiot. Anyway, also he spoke about injury news. Laviar and Nkunku look like they're edging towards a return. They obviously won't be available for selection in this match. And he also, very in Interestingly, spoke about Nicholas Jackson. Now, the question was put to him of sort of where he sees Nicholas Jackson of being at right now and if he's happy that he got that hat-trick for his confidence. And Pochettino, very, very refreshingly, said, yeah, he got a hat-trick, that was good, he should have scored six. And do you know what? A lot of people could take that in a bad way and they could take that as a sign or an indication that maybe Nicholas Jackson will not be starting that match. But I think that's a bit of a masterstroke from Pochettino, you know, because I think it showed that, look, in the fact that he's picking him in the starting lineup and he picked him in the starting lineup against Spurs showed definitely that Pochettino is giving Nicholas Jackson his chance. He's putting his trust in him. We heard comments about what he feels Nicholas Jackson could go on to potentially achieve in his career um, earlier on in the season. But... To say Nicholas Jackson has been somewhat underwhelming at times would probably be an understatement. He divides opinion. I get it. I've done a video earlier on this week with Joel Bayer on the Best of London, our weekly episode. So check that one out if you want to see my thoughts on Nicholas Jackson, some of the comparisons I made with him to other top strikers. But Mauricio Pochettino said that he did score a hat-trick and well done to him for it, but he should have got six. And I actually love that because I do genuinely think that Pochettino needs to be looking at that performance and thinking, okay, yeah, brilliant. We played well for a lot of it. The narrative going round at the minute that we didn't play well against Spurs and that if Spurs had 11 men on the field, they would have battered us. That is a complete fucking joke as well. Let's be honest. Like we were in control when they have had 11 on the field, sorry, um, after we drew level. So, but onto Nicholas Jackson specifically, when he says that he should have scored six, I think that that's good because I think it's giving the player incentive to realise, OK, you're doing well, but just because you've scored a hat-trick, that doesn't mean you can now relax, take your foot off the gas and think you've got money in the bank because your place could be in jeopardy. And I think that that is good for players to sort of drive them on and, and competition can only be healthy. So Mauricio Pochettino's comments there impressed me. But as I say, it did leave a lot of people potentially thinking, does this mean that Nicholas Jackson won't be starting? And obviously, when we look at Manchester City, our opponents in the this match. Stylistically, they match up closest to Arsenal. I'm not saying they're a like for like, but they do match up closest to them. And we saw the system we went for against Arsenal was obviously without Nicholas Jackson in the lineup. We didn't have Jackson there. We didn't have Brower there. And obviously we didn't have David Washington there because he's hardly played for us. We started with Cole Palmer up top in that sort of position. But if you actually looked at it throughout the match, it was sort of Cole Palmer and Conor Gallagher progressing furthest up the field. So a lot of people I've seen today have fought or said that maybe that was an indication that Jackson won't be starting. I am not so sure about it. So without any further ado, let's get in to the team that I would pick. Now, I mentioned the Arsenal game, and you'll see along the back line, I've gone pretty similar. We're obviously starting off with Robert Sanchez in goal. Now, this will be a game, at least on our behalf, of fine margins. Manchester City... 
will probably get so many chances in this match that maybe they can afford to waste one or two. Chelsea, I don't think will. And that means we need to be massively, massively clinical in front of goal. Now, where does Robert Sanchez come into that? What we also need to do is be very tight at the back. We can't give anything away. And I'm not just talking about, obviously, the Declan Rice goal against Arsenal where Robert Sanchez gives the ball away. Some will argue that Enzo or Gallagher, whoever was there, was at fault. But ultimately, Sanchez gives the ball away. Declan Rice scores. And I'm not necessarily talking about that one example. I was at the Brighton game the week before um, and he gave the ball away a few times in the cup you know we've seen it time in time out sometimes when the ball went back to him against Spurs he didn't look the most comfortable and one of the things that we brought Robert Sanchez in for was his ball playing ability with his feet and I actually do think his ball playing ability with his feet is quite good you can go on YouTube and you can see some of the balls that he was putting through to the wingers at Brighton when he was there um, and, and there is potential there for him to get it right but I do think it's a little bit shaky and I would just like to see him hoof it up, even if it means giving away possession, if that ball goes back to him in a really tight space and he's not confident he can make that pass. Along the back line, I said I was going similar to the Arsenal match. I am with one change. Reese James obviously comes in for Melo Gusto. We always knew that Reese James was going to be coming in to that lineup when he was back fit and available, which is obviously a massive shame because in Melo Gusto, you have a player who, in my opinion, was performing really, really well. He got that red card, but ultimately... You know, season's gone by. We might not have even seen him pick up a red card there. Thiago Silva paired with Levi Colwell. Now, Levi Colwell came... I'm not going to say under fire, under a little bit of criticism in that last match because there was times, or there was one specific time, I should say, when he got way too fiery with the Spurs defender. I can't even remember who it was now. It was Saar. It was Saar, I think it was. Way too fiery. If the match wasn't already intense and if it wasn't on boiling point, you could have seen a red card for both men there because, you know, it wasn't just squaring up. It was pushing and shoving and obviously you're not allowed to put your hands on another player. I think because the match was a fiery affair anyway, the ref wanted to take Sting out of things. He just booked them both. But in a match where at the time we were obviously drawing, but uh, were we drawing? We were drawing, yeah. And we had one extra man on the field. Spurs are 10 we had 11. We cannot take risks. So in this game, obviously, look, if I'm Pep Guardiola, I'm going to be saying to my players, look, this kid's fiery. This kid can boil over at any point. So let's target him a little bit. Um, and I think that could happen. So I do want to see him keep a cool, calm, composed head. But Levi Colwell definitely in that centre-back pairing for me. And on the left-hand side, that opens up a slot because Levi colwell has been playing there. And I'm going to be honest with you, for me, it has got to be Mark Kukurea. Now, Mark Kukurea, in his five Premier League appearances so far, he's ranked first in the team for total tackles, first for tackles one, first for possession one in the defensive third, and third for interceptions and third for clearances. Kukurea is having a complete rebirth in this Chelsea side currently under Pochettino, and he's a player that obviously in the past I'd spoke down on, I'd said he's not Chelsea level, and I'm very, very happy to be humbly eating my words here because Kukurea is looking really good at the moment. And look, I don't really think there's many left backs that can live up to the sort of price tag that Kukurea came in for. But I tell you what, he is 10 times, 20 times, he's a thousand times better than he was last season. So big up Kukurea, I'm very, very proud of him. Now we all know that the midfield picks itself. It's obviously Caicedo paired with Enzo and Conor Gallagher who will be pushed slightly forward. Conor Gallagher having legs in that midfield, not that Enzo and Caicedo don't, but he really is the workhorse in there. And obviously when it comes to chances created and, you know, big chances created leading to goals, especially for Chelsea, Conor Gallagher has been our man this season. It's a midfield three that I think has perfect balance. I think they have a good understanding with each other already and I think they can only get better and better when you look at their profiles and their age however out of those three if there's one man that I want to see a little bit more from it's the man that I think out of those three would probably slot the most seamlessly into Manchester City's midfield and that is Enzo Fernandez. Enzo's a great player you know um, and I think that he looked a class above a lot of what was round him last season. And we looked at that and we thought, right, we need to pair him, sorry, with a Caicedo or a Romeo Lavia. We bought both. Um, but now we've done so. I really want to see Enzo take it to the next level. And obviously, we can't have the excuse now of what well, he's playing on the poor side because, OK, people have abandoned me. We, you know, we lost to Brentford. We lost to a few teams this season, but it was not a poor side. You know, we're a side that's young. 
Uh, probably a bit wet behind the ears, but we're showing a lot of potential. And I do think with Gallagher in there that does a lot of the running for him, with Caicedo in there that cuts out a lot of the balls and also, you know, gets about the pitch, Enzo is freed up ever so slightly to be able to play those beautiful passes that we've seen and to be able to be the sort of player that we bought him in at that 100 million plus price tag for. So I do want to start to see a lot more from Enzo Fernandez. It's not me saying that he's been underperforming, but he's probably been the one out of that three maybe that's been the weakest so far. So it's not, you know, it's not a massive issue for me. But anyway, let's go on to the forward line. Obviously, the big question on everyone's lips is, am I starting a number nine. The only number nine I could probably be starting is Nicholas Jackson, obviously. He's just scored a hat-trick. Bro is unavailable. Washington looks like he's about 12 years old, but, you know, good lad, probably. Um, <sighs> look, this is a really hard one, isn't it? I look at that game against Arsenal. I know I've said it, but, you know, that game against Arsenal, we looked really, really good, really, really creative, and it, it looked like it flowed very well. And obviously, Cole Palmer, if he was more central, would possibly have more opportunities at goal. And I know that he would absolutely love to get on the score sheet against his former side, Manchester City. There must be a part of Cole Palmer that looks at this game and thinks, you lot are stupid to let me go. I should have been in that team ahead of the likes of a Foden, maybe. You know, you brought Doku in, and I can play out on that side. And I know Doku's looking electric so far, but Doku's been about for a while, you know, and people weren't, you know, biting your hand off for Doku before. Um, so maybe feels like he's got a bit of a grudge there, bit disrespected by Pep Guardiola and wants to go in and prove a point. And for that reason, starting him in the number nine, as well as his performance against Arsenal would be sensible. <sighs> but something tells me that Nicholas Jackson's going to start there and something tells me he's going to score in this match. Let's go, Jackson. Number nine. I don't know why. Just a little gut feeling. Something tells me Jackson gets a goal in this match. I can just see someone cutting it back to him in the box and him putting in a cool, calm, composed finish, which is not what we've seen from him a lot of the time. So don't know. Don't know. Maybe I'm in, uh, I'm in dreamland. But anyway, Cole Palmer will have on the wing. In seven starts so far this season, Cole Palmer has seven goal contributions. Since the second he came into Chelsea and started finding himself in the starting 11s, he has been lighting it up. He's cool, calm, composed, everything you would want from a player, especially of such a young age as well. You look at Madison withdrawing from the England squad today, Cole Palmer should surely be in with a shout to have a late call up by Gareth Southgate. I know he plays in the under-21 side, but he is a wise, wise head on young shoulders. And for a young English player to go into a club first season, get in a big transfer in the summer, and to be able to light it up like he has, is just unreal. I mean, let's think, like, off the top of my head, Fairly young English player that's had a transfer this summer. Uh, let's go with completely random Mason Mount, for example. Uh, 11 appearances for Man United so far. No goals, one assist. That came in the cup against Crystal Palace. So, you know, or, or, or we could even look at Akai Havertz, for example. He's had about 18 appearances for Arsenal now. One assist. Yeah, brilliant. Against City. One goal. It was a penalty gifted to him in about a fucking 25 nil win over Bournemouth. So, what I'm trying to say here, I'm not trying to mug them off, but yeah, Cole Palmer is magic. Long may it continue. He's starting on the wing for me. And on the other side, there really is one, only one man, I should say, to start. Raheem Sterling is not making it into this lineup for me. I'm sorry, guys. You're not going to like it, probably. Or some of you might. But do you know what? This season, Carl Walker is playing beyond his years. Beyond his years? Should it be below his years? You know what I'm saying. He's He's been playing well. But despite... The pace he still has and what a brilliant defender he is at the age of 33. I do look stylistically at stylistic matchups against Kyle Walker in this match. And I don't think Raheem Sterling is going to be the best option. Raheem Sterling has turned a corner this year or, or gone back to old a little bit in terms of taking men on and beating them. But I wouldn't fancy him in a battle up against Kyle Walker. And I do think that you look at some of the balls we were slotting through from the midfield against Spurs. Not the Man City will be playing this high line with, you know, nine men there. But I do think that Mikhailo Mudrik is the man you got to match up there with Kyle Walker. I'm not saying it will definitely work, but I just think that Mikhailo Mudrik can possibly give Kyle Walker more problems than maybe a Raheem Sterling could. Now, obviously, I look at that lineup. I think he's a very strong lineup. It is probably not a massively, massively changed, but significant changes um, in terms of the Tottenham lineup that we saw. And I do look at it and think 
probably quite unrealistic that Pochettino is going to go with that. I think the Sassi will feature in Pochettino's lineup. Maybe Levi Colwell over at left back again, which would be a shame because Kukurea is playing so well. I do think Pochettino will start Jackson. I think his comments would be a lot worse if he didn't then start Jackson by saying, you know, you should have got six. I think the way Pochettino man manages these players is he'll say that comment there to let you know, like, listen, mate, you're not off the hook. You need to be converting these chances, but he will then start him and give him the opportunity. I just don't think he will start Mikhailo Mudrick. I think Sterling's Pochettino's man. I think he trusts him. And I think that he feels he's one of those players on the pitch that in the heat of the battle probably won't lose his head and is able to deliver um, in his sort of game plan against these uh, against these sides. The only thing I do know is Sterling doesn't really score against the bigger clubs. I would give Mikhailo Mudrik a chance. Anyway, let's look at Manchester City. And unless you lot have been living under a rock, you know that these lot are the real deal. They can go into matches against any of the big sides and be significant favourites. They can go into matches against any of the big sides and literally tear them a new one. You look at them against Arsenal last season, the team that many people were tipping to win the league. And obviously, not only did they come back and you know, breach the points gap, uh, the points gap, sorry, over them, but also both times they played them, they pretty much battered them. And I look at the form they're on recently, you know, they put Man United to the sword. A lot of people have been beating Man United, probably not the best example, Newcastle earlier on in the season. Now, Newcastle were a team that I massively rate. And obviously, we look at Manchester City against Newcastle earlier on in the season, not like the scoreline was really significant, but the way they nullified them was, was something that you can only look at and really understand that these are the guys setting the pace in this Premier League. However, they can be got at. Obviously, you look, they've lost to Arsenal now. They've lost to Wolves. I wish we had played them before those matches because I do genuinely feel like when Pep Guardiola's City go through the gears, there's no stopping them. I wouldn't be surprised if they go on a 15 unbeaten run uh, now. So it will be very hard. And obviously, if you look at our record of recent against City, it ain't great. Three wins in our last 10 matches and we have lost six on the bounce to them. I was at a couple of those matches last season. It wasn't pretty viewing. But Chelsea have always got a chance. We've got tremendous talent in our squad. We've got a good manager. And I do think we've got a little bit of a buzz around us. And as I said, we play better against the bigger teams. But what do Chelsea need to do to win this match? And for me, it's actually quite simple. A lot more simple than it is easy to do. And that is defend really, really well. And take our chances when we get them. I see City being able to have a lot of possession. Um, obviously, they press really well. They win the ball back quickly. And their intensity is something that, you know, if Chelsea could play in that way, I'll be over the moon. So I see City having a lot of the runner play, but I do think there's going to be, you know, lots of opportunities, I should say, to catch them on the counter attack. And I think that when we do that, we can't be wasteful like we were against Tottenham. We scored four against Tottenham. We could have had 10. Yeah, we cannot be that wasteful. We need to be making sure we convert our chances against City. And I do genuinely believe that we can do that if we are able to take a bit of confidence from that Tottenham game. Maybe not so much the performance, but definitely the result and take that into this game. But... We need to be concentrated to a T at the back because we look at obviously the lapses of concentration against Arsenal. That pretty much cost us the game or cost us the three points, I should say. Also against Brentford, you know, man at the back post that goes in. We can't be giving City those sort of opportunities. And it's a little bit funny because our back line has always been something that I've been very, very bullish on. It's not been something that I've been worried about or an aspect of our team that I've been worried about. It's more been the goal scoring. But now we're starting to score some goals, but the back line's looking a little bit leaky from time to time. So we need to be so composed. We need Thiago Silva to have a masterclass in this game, organise that defence and make sure everyone is pulling up their socks and giving 150%. And most importantly, we need to try as hard as we can to limit the chances that fall to Erling Haaland. However, I would say Erling Haaland has never scored against Chelsea. So he's had a couple of chances to do so as well. We've got a funny little knack, haven't we, really, of actually keeping some of the star, star names fairly quiet against us. Like... I think in years gone by, Messi, I know he ended up getting a few goals against Chelsea, but it took about eight or nine matches to do so, didn't he? He never used to score against us in the beginning. Ronaldo, he played against Chelsea 17 times for Man United, and he only scored twice against us. And I'm pretty sure that both of those goals came when he went back to United. I'm pretty sure. No, only one of them in the Premier League came. When he was back at United, um, obviously... 
header in the Champions League final. So, yeah. But, you know, Suarez, he never used to score all that often against us. A lot of the bigger names when it comes to my head. I'll tell you one man who did, though. Thierry Henry used to bang goals against us. But, anyway, I'm rambling here. I'm just saying we do have a knack of keeping the bigger players quiet. Haaland isn't all we need to worry about, but they are still without Kevin De Bruyne. Um, and I do think that we can limit a lot of their chances. So, if we can be defensively cute and make sure that when we do get our chances, we take them, I do think that we can get something out of this game. But I'm a realist. I'm, I'm not going to just be overly optimistic and flamboyant because of that Spurs win. I understand that, you know, we will be underdogs in this match. The bookies have us, I think, at 19 to 5. So we are significant underdogs. But whether we're underdogs or not, we have pulled off an underdog win already this season. And I do think that maybe the level of expectation being low on us could benefit us. One thing I do know, or I do really, really hope, is the Stamford Bridge crowd will be massively, massively up and excited for this game. Because after the support we see away at Tottenham, it was phenomenal. Like, the away fans were absolutely unreal. We need to make sure that Stamford Bridge is rocking. Now, on the possibility that we do win this game, and it is a possibility, it's not impossible that at Stamford Bridge, we turn City over. If we do win it, it moves us up to ninth. Um because Brentford will surely lose away at Liverpool, you would hope. And you know what? It could even take us as high as seventh. Man United have got Luton at home. You'd fancy them as heavy favourites, but Man United are all over the gaff. And obviously Brighton are at home to Sheffield United. Again, you'd fancy them, but Brighton are underwhelming a little bit as well. So if results go in our favour, we could be as high as seventh. And then we're looking at things and we're going, we have not lost to one of the bigger teams. We've not lost to Liverpool, Arsenal, Spurs, City, if this happens. And then if we can figure out how to work out these low blocks and beat some of the smaller teams that come to be more defensive, we can have a genuine push at Champions League football. Am I getting ahead of myself? Yes, of course, massively, but I'm a Chelsea fan and this is what I do. If we don't win, I just hope we can play well enough that we can take something into the match against Newcastle away at St. James's Park after the international break because that's a huge match. Newcastle have a lot of injuries, so I do give us a chance. But again, anyone who watches me consistently on this channel on the kickoff will know that I really, really rate Newcastle. Would I take a draw? Yes. And for that reason, my prediction for this match is a one-all draw. I don't know whether I'm thinking with my head, with my heart. Whether I'm being overly optimistic, I get it. The odds are stacked against us, but fuck them. They've only been a club since 2009. We don't care about City anyway. Anyway, for this match, I will be live on the kickoff. Um, I think we'll be live from about four o'clock. So me, Brian... Josh is going to the match. He's not going to be on the kickoff this week. So there'll be a few of us. We'll have a good cast on there. It will be a good laugh. Tune in if you want to see my immediate reaction. I will try and get a video out for you guys straight away after the match. Once again, thank you all very, very much. If you haven't done so, please, before you click off the video, smash the like button. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. And I will see you all in the next one.